Let me please, as IAU Secretary General of uh, the International Association of University, wish you all a very warm welcome to this webinar today on acting and educating for sustainable development at universities, uh, where uh, the speakers will provide for some examples uh, on how IAU developed uh, work around sustainable development around the world, um, and also from um, an association of students uh, and uh, colleagues from South Africa, Lithuania, and Costa Rica. The session will be led by Stephen Sterling, uh, who is Professor of Sustainability, um, and as well um, a researcher today, working on many aspects that he developed throughout his career at the University of Plymouth, but today um, exploring further uh, in his new, new capacities. So very warm welcome to this session. We can go to the next slide just quickly to introduce you to where we're speaking from for those who may not know. So these are the speakers that you are um, to hear uh, today and listen to uh, four speakers with one moderator from the UK. So next slide, please. Just where we speak from. So the International Association of Universities is the global voice of higher education. We indeed are the global association of universities that was called into life in 1950 by UNESCO. Uh, today, we are still an independent, international, non-governmental organization with associate status uh, to UNESCO and with uh, ECOSOC accreditation, and we're based at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. Our mandate is global, and so we uh, do work with universities of um, many different forms, shapes, uh, sizes from around the world, and very pleased to do so, as our aim is to um, provide for a voice for higher education to, high, to the governments around the world, and in particular to UN, UN organizations such as UNESCO. Next slide, please. Higher education for sustainable development is one of the four key priority areas of work for the IAU. We work in particular on um, sustainable development and higher education since the early 90s. Apart from that, the three other priority areas of work are internationalization, value-based leadership, and the digital transformation of higher education, which has gained uh, tremendous momentum uh, very recently, as you know. So what did we do as far as higher education is concerned? We worked with many of the people that you will hear uh, on screen today and during the webinar on advancing the, on the role of higher education for sustainable development, because we are strongly uh, be believing that higher education has a key role to play in advancing uh, sustainable development and developing the kind of societies that we wish for many to be able to benefit from uh, around the world. More recently, with the adoption of Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, we have uh, decided to engage more strongly with the SDGs and invited universities from around the world to lead on any of the SDGs and to build around them subclusters to work on any of the SDGs. This slide is uh, a slide to just show that uh, at the very beginning, higher education was not that much involved in the drafting and finalization of the Agenda 2030, yet higher education was mentioned in the nine SDGs that you see on screen. We have since the adoption of the agenda been able, with many other players around the world, to showcase that higher education has a key role to play for any of the SDGs and not only the nine that you see on the screen. Next slide, please. So here you see that the uh, SDGs have been picked up around the world. And so they're located where the, the lead institutions are located. And every time we've invited uh, any of the lead institutions to build uh, partnerships around the world, to always bring on board of uh, the work they do, institutions from the four other continents. And these dynamics within the higher education uh, for sustainability uh, cluster 
are really um, leading to very interesting and very dynamic work. And we see, um, as you can see here, that the sustainable development goals are certainly not for one part of the world. They're similarly important for every part of the world. And as you will hear from the speakers, they're gaining um, tremendous momentum as well. We need to focus on that much more. But it's my pleasure here to, um, to welcome uh, to the, to the um, table Stephen Sterling, who's the IEU Senior Fellow and he's the Emeritus Professor for the Center of Sustainable Futures, Sustainable Earth Institute at the University of Plymouth. And as I said, he is a, um, a key uh, driver for sustainability. Uh, not only in the UK, uh, but everywhere in the world. And he takes the lead on the debate that we have here today. We have registered the, debit and the webinar as part of uh, the events leading up to the upcoming UNESCO World Conference on ESD. And uh, with Stephen and the, the different speakers, we're very pleased to, uh, at the end of the session, also distill a few recommendations that we would like to bring to the UNESCO World Conference on ESD. So Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hillage. So um, very warm welcome to everybody, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting, really rich discussion today. Um, so we have four speakers, as Helich said, um, Inga from Lithuania, Diana from Costa Rica, Jade from the UK, and Hela from South Africa. So a really good geographical spread. If not, I may say a very good gender spread, but I'd also think it might be all the better for it, but we'll see. <laughs> um, anyway, so each speaker will talk for about five minutes um, on, the th on the, today's theme from their own experience. Then we'll have a panel discussion for about 40 minutes around the questions which have been pre-formulated, but that won't limit us necessarily. Um, and then a Q&A from everybody, really, and there's a, a large number of people on the webinar today, but let's hope that your question gets, gets through somehow. Please send the questions in anyway, because it all helps us uh, get feedback on, on what's happening. Um, so uh, I've been asked to do a very short contextualization of this webinar, because I think we live in really interesting times anyway, and then <clears throat> in terms of uh, higher education too, in response to those interesting times. As you all know, there's now multiple crises affecting the world and the planet, and uh, higher awareness and concern than there has been for years. I think there's growing pressure uh, and a demand for response across many sectors, um, not just education, but of course, education is part of that because it's critical to assuring the future. So there's pressure uh, now on universities to, make, to ensure that the usual concerns of research and teaching excellence and competitive league tables, student and staff retention, all these things which concern universities to put them in a broader vision and goal of social and economic well-being, nested in the imperative of planetary survival. So I think higher education has an unrivaled capacity to shape the knowledge and values and skills and research that are crucial to society in transition to a low carbon and safe future, if it can mobilize itself in this direction. But having worked in this area for several decades, I, I, I'm, I'm really surprised. Um, well, I, I guess I've never known the level of activity and interest now um, compared to previous years. Um, some of the younger of you may not know that the call to reorient education towards sustainability goes at least back uh, some 30 years to the 1992 Earth Summit. Uh, as part of the Agenda 21, which came out of that summit. We're now, of course, into Agenda 2030, uh, and with the climate crisis and the COP26 conference, which is about to happen in the UK in the autumn, there's a renewal of concern, and but also enthusiasm for change, I think. And re this idea of rethinking and repurposing is very much in evidence across various sectors, including education. And I think there's a growing concern about how to affect a shift in the role of education from servicing the global economy towards sustainable well-being across uh, environmental, cultural, social, 
and economic aspects involving greater social and environmental responsibility. The Sustainable De Development Goals, of course, have been and still are a major influence on stimulating rethinking and action, and a good deal is happening. So just to, just to paint that picture very briefly before moving on to our speakers, of course, there's all the work of IAU's Global Cluster on HESD. Um, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network has just asked for a new or renewed bank of case studies on what universities are doing internationally towards sustainability. In my, in my own case, my, work, my current work has been involved in a, a special issue on repurposing universities of sustainable human progress of a journal, and the response there has been tremendous. And also working with a great transition initiative on the education for the future we want. And again, there's been a real, really lively uh, response on that theme. And then of course, more broadly, the UNESCO Futures of Education debate is going on, led by an international commission, which will report in the autumn, looking at what kind of education we need for the times we live in. And then of course, as Hillage said, uh, UNESCO is also running the imminent World Conference on ESD which is all about aligning ESD with the SDGs and looking forward to the key date of 2030. So a lot happening, and I see this webinar as part of this burgeoning discussion and process really, but and uh, not just discussion, but action too. So warm welcome again to the webinar. Um, speakers and uh, Elish and Isabel and myself had a short preparatory meeting on Friday and based on what the speaker said then, I think this is going to be a really interesting session. So welcome again. I'm going to move straight on to inviting our speakers to contribute their, their short uh, inputs and um, just remind speakers it should be five minutes and um, I shall wave a sort of a, a metaphorical big stick if it's much more than that. <laughs> I should try anyway. Um, so um, to begin, uh, can I welcome Inga, and I know I'll get this wrong. Inga, my apologies. Zelenien. Um, Zelenien. Thank you. <laughs> I knew I'd get it wrong. Uh, apologies. Um, from uh, Mikolas Romanus University in Lithuania. And uh, Inga, welcome and look forward to your contribution. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you, IAU, for inviting me to join uh, today's webinar and to, to have a possibility to share my represented university experience uh, in uh, sustainable development journey. I represent Mikolas Romerus University, situated in the capital city, Vilnius, the youngest uh, public university in Lithuania, specializing in social sciences. Uh, university's evolution from the beginning of its existence embedded the elements of sustainability, especially social and economic dimensions, and it can be introduced as a, a good example of sustainable development in higher education sector. Um, Mikolas Romarus University has no prehistory in the period of Soviet occupation and was established just in few weeks after the restoration of uh, the independence of Lithuania uh, in 1990s. As the Soviet period strongly idealized the social sciences, at the beginning Lithuania was undoubtedly facing the shortage of uh, social uh, science, uh, science specialists and uh, um, expertise in various social sciences areas. Uh, the advancement of the re-established state uh, had to be developed in pursuit of Western democratic humanistic values, uh, rule of law, uh, human rights and freedoms, uh, urgent transition from planned uh, to market economy. Uh, training of a new generation of law enforcement officers, lawyers, specialists for public governance sector was needed urgently and university fully fulfilled this obligation and mission from the beginning. Uh, the national social demands were gradually 
unfolding uh, the university reflected uh, to the needs uh, and expanded its portfolio in social sciences preparing people capable to managing the social processes and our academics and researchers were actively involved in drafting of the Lithuanian constitution main legal acts creating a new legal and public governance systems contributed to the main strategic reforms in all sectors of the country Growing together with the state and society during the 31 years of intensive progress, university naturally expanded the range of study programs, uh, created an innovative interdisciplinary research and innovation ecosystem, wide network of national and international partners, prepared for the professional market more than 40,000 alumni, united a uh, professional vibrant community, uh, which is constantly contributing to the growth of the state, uh, region, and also globally. Being an active member of IAU, we fully support the IAU aim to accelerate action for the SDGs through global cluster of higher education for sustainable development. We are my represented institution and directly our environment management lab researchers participate as satellite of the SDG 11 for sustainable cities and communities. Also last year, the university has joined the United Nations Academic Impact Initiative that aligns institutions with the United Nations uh, working for sustainable development. Uh, working on the creation of new university strategy for the upcoming years, university community have accepted the responsibility and committed uh, to integrate the sustainable development framework and SDGs into the new vision, mission, and overall strategy of the university. The recent strategy is focused on sustainable university vision implementation of a holistic whole institution approach, including all three dimensions, social, economic, and, and environmental. Moreover, a detailed plan for sustainable development activities with an allocated budget for the upcoming three years period was adopted at the end of last year. It contains of the aims, targets, and KPIs uh, that are leading our community towards the implementation of sustainable development in teaching, research, community engagement, and service to society activities, also leadership, campus landscape, operations, and infrastructure. We understand that it will take time, all stakeholders' involvement, peer-to-peer -peer learning, networking, lots of hard work and additional funding, but I am sure we are on the right track. Excellent, excellent time. Yeah, excellent, excellent timing too. Thank you very much, Inga, that's great. So we're going to move straight through the program with the speakers rather than stop and then we'll come back to a wider round, uh, round discussion. So thanks Inga. So can I now ask Diana from Costa Rica to contribute, make her contribution. Thank you very much Diana and welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Um, good afternoon Western Hemisphere and good morning North America, Latin America, Caribbean, Buenos Dias. Um, this is an um, amazing opportunity to be around you. Uh, and it's an honor for me to be part of this um, webinar. Um, I want to just share a little. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see my screen there? Yes. Okay, cool. So, um, greetings from the sunny, latter, um, rainy Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a um, developing 
country uh, located in Central America, so it's next to Panama for those of you who, who doesn't uh, know where it's located. Uh, I want to say hi to everybody uh, from my country, from Mexico, and from Colombia as well. Um, as a country, uh, we have subscribed to sustainable development goals uh, from 1 to 17, but it's true that we have, as a university, stick to number 15, uh, life on land. So for that matter, um, life on land, the University of Costa Rica promotes its transversal education in humanities. One of the fundamental axes is the sustainable environment perspective, which is approached from history, from literature, from philosophy, arts in general, and from basic sciences. For that matter, we work the sustainable uh, or sustainability article in the teaching, the researching, and social action from the grassroots and from the uh, communities as the three pillars that support and characterize our DNA as university. So how we target um, the education? First of all, with um, sustainable development uh, for protection of the nature in a peaceful and gradual social change, which is an organized and planned uh, way that modifies our relationship with nature. So we work with groups of students, with teachers, with uh, researchers in the field work. Uh, and the UCR is um, accessible and actor and inclusive education promoter with equity, with quality, and uh, with opportunities for its community and partners is how we connect the uh, sustainable development with uh, the different um, personalities and actors in the, in the country. Then we have um, the ecological development. So it has to do with economic, with the creative resources distribution, with ecological, less exploitation of natural resources, more research in terms of clean technologies that we are working really hard on it. Um, geographical, this rural, urban, dealing with regional national landscapes that is very uh, outstanding in terms of what's going on in the country. And the social and cultural justice uh, in terms of respect and in terms of majority slash diversity inclusion because in our country, in, in Latin America, especially the nowadays world, we have to be more observant of this kind of you know, situations going on in, in the world. So the UCR is, has its uh, leadership role in science and technology and innovation fields <clears throat> dealing with the different communities and um, cultures that come together and work in terms of development. And for the third um, pillar, we have the environmental citizenship uh, dealing with this third generation rights uh, has to do with economic and social in terms of solidarity, in terms of peace, development, environment which is a real challenge nowadays, and we're still uh, working hard in terms of these major, major challenges. So when we see the UCR, you know, it's Costa Rica, uh, we see it as a main contributor to the social, to the economic and the environmental development of the Costa Rican territory. And this deals with not only um, Costa Rica, but Central America, we deal with our, um, the connections with um, the borders, um, we have this environmental solution going on, uh, especially from the class and going um, straight to the communities. And this is how we um, link the three spheres of teaching, of um, researching and social action in the um, territory of, uh, of our country. And that will be um, for my uh, first um, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you again for excellent timekeeping. So very interesting to hear the role of the University of Costa Rica uh, on this work, given Costa Rica's reputation uh, for its approach to sustainable development. Um, I think it's particularly interesting. So uh, thank you. And moving swiftly on, as they say, to Jade from Students Organizing for Sustainability. So Jade is not from a university, but from a student-focused national organization, which I know, uh, because I'm also in the UK, has had a terrific effect on uh, the uptake of sustainability in universities in all respects, and she can talk about it far better than me. Uh, and I think she's also going to touch on its international influence too. So Jade, over to you. Thank you very much. 
Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. I should just share my screen now. There we are. So hopefully everyone can see that. Okay. So yeah, I'm Jade and I'm from SOS UK. And SOS UK, we so we started off as being the National Union of Student in the UK Sustainability Department, and we're now our own entity. So as NUS is kind of a family, so we're still part of that National Union of Students family. We represent over 550 student union members, which represents over 7 million students within the UK. And for us, what we really are trying to do through SOS UK is to inspire, is to empower students to really lead on sustainability. And seeing that as very much as a long term investment in education now and so that we can get a better future for tomorrow. And as Stephen was saying, we have SOS UK, but we also have our international arm as well. So that is Students Organising for Sustainability International. And that's really kind of a collective membership of other organisations across the globe that are doing work on sustainability with students as well. And really trying to facilitate sharing of ideas and of campaigns and actions across the globe. And for us, our mission is mainly to be getting more students leaning, leading on, learning about sustainability, getting that really embedded into the formal education, right from kind of early years up to adult learning, and then making sustainability more inclusive. So it's for ev everyone, it's not just those that have an interest within sustainability. Um, a lot of our work is really led by student perception and demand for sustainability. So here in the UK, we have been doing an annual survey every year for, for over 10 years now. And we've also recently done that within an international context as well. And the results always kind of consistently show similar results and very similar from the UK and an international perspective as well. So we are seeing that students are really concerned about climate change. So over 90% of students are reporting that, that it is a concern for them. And I know benchmarking that against the UK, that's about 10% more students are concerned about climate change than the general population. We're also saying that students are really wanting to see sustainability incorporated in their academic institution and in their studies. So 92% are saying that their place of study should incorporate active, actively incorporate and promote sustainable development. And there's a little bit of a mismatch there, though, in terms of when it then goes to reporting on what students are actually seeing within their higher education institution. We've got around 40% of students saying that there is a low or no coverage of sustainable development within their course curriculum. And for me, more surprisingly, we had 76% of students saying that if they want information on climate change, they go online and only 24% are actually going to their teachers and to their educators. So for us, this is really showing that students can care about the climate, they want to be learning more about it. But at the moment, there's a bit of a gap there between what they want and what they're actually receiving from, from their institution, and from the educators. So ourselves at SOS UK and SOS International, and we know that universities are also working really hard on this as well, is to kind of try and fill that gap somewhat. So first and foremost, we do a lot of work on engaging students. In the past, this was very much kind of on behaviour change campaigns, but I think more and more we're trying to work on student campaigning, on activism, on learning and development opportunities to really get students at the heart of those kind of sustainable learning and solutions going forward. We also do a lot of work on engaging educators. So this is making sure that we can get sustainability kind of embedded both in the campus, but also in the learning across all disciplines. So we have campaigns such as our SDG teaching, where we're trying to get academics to kind of pledge to try and embed sustainability into their courses and their work within the university. And we're also taking approaches such as institution-wide approaches too. And it was nice to see that Inga was reporting that they're also trying to do this in Lithuania as well. So that's really about trying to get those whole institution approaches to sustainability. So embedding it across all areas of learning from strategy down to student kind of course of work, having that in the formal and informal curriculum. And for us, it's also about making sure that the student involvement is really at the heart of that. 
So we have a number of campaigns that we run on that kind of accreditation marks. We get students mapping out their curriculum. Um, but we also know that higher education are doing a lot of work within their own institutions on these campaigns and often kind of in collaboration with ourselves as well. So I think for me, that's a kind of a quick whistle stop tour of what we do. Great, thanks Jade. Yes, Thank yeah, an indication of the breadth of uh, the work that's been going on there. And before SOS was formed, which was two years ago, Jade, was that right? So NUS was still very involved in this in this area, very effectively so, I think, too, uh, and respected internationally for its pioneering work. So yeah, and and you know the whole issue of the gap between where what students. Uh, are interested in and what they actually receive in terms of provision is something we all all want to um, see uh, closed I think and maybe some of the uh, lessons coming out of experience today will help with that uh, process. So thank you Jade and now on to um, Hela from South Africa, um, Hela Lotsitsitsitka who's Reputation goes before her, I think, if I can say that. <laughs> Hela uh, has been working for many years in this area in, a, in an innovative, uh, very active way. Uh, and I'd like to hand over to Hela as our last speaker of the four. Thanks, Hela. Thank you very much, Stephen. And thank you to the colleagues that have opened up before me. I think they raised some very important dimensions of this work, the whole institution approach, the roles of universities in countries, the roles of mobilizing students, very, very critical. I want to focus in on the point that Jade made about involving the educators. And I think if I had to characterize my work, I'm from an education faculty and we have a center called the Environmental Learning Research Center on our campus here at Rhodes University. And probably the work we've done most over the last 30 years is to work with educators to become more orientated to working with sustainability in the educational institutions and in the education system itself at a broader level. So some of the work that we've been doing with higher education institutions um, really spans also a number of countries. We started in the early days with a what we called the SADC Regional Environmental Education Program Course Developers Network, where we were working with about 15 uh, um, different uh, academics from different faculties in different universities in different countries. And what we were trying to do was to build a social movement and momentum for higher education curriculum transformation and sustainability. And that actually gave rise to what was later called the mainstreaming of environment and sustainability in African universities program, which we cooperated quite a lot with Hilliger and the IAU and the African Association of Universities and UNEP during the UN decade. And there we were working with universities in probably about 50 countries eventually both in Africa and Asia, and, and really working with university academics, the teachers uh, and the um, managers and the heads of departments and the deans and the sometimes even the vice chancellors <laughs> to think about, you know, what does sustainability mean in terms of, of change in their institutions and their societies? And so in this program, we developed a very strong systemic view, also influenced by Stephen's work and other work in this area, we worked with academics across different disciplines. And I remember, you know, being in the same room with law professors and education professors and engineering professors and amazing experience to have that kind of diversity in one space, talking about sustainability and what it means for our universities. We also talked a lot about and worked a lot on the notion of the whole institution transformation in its community. And this was a very powerful um, space in, in African society because our universities have been very much, um, how can you call it, severed from communities in the notion of the ivory tower. And so there was a very strong interest actually in breaking down this ivory tower and taking the universities into communities. And that of course opened up a big area of active and transformative pedagogy. And we've done some fantastic work with these colleagues over the years on transformative pedagogy. And then ultimately one is really looking at cultural change in the institution. So you want cultural change, you know, into your operations and management, into the way in which you work with students, 
student involvement, let students actually drive the change. And we've really tried to encourage, you know, much more student engagement, student, students leading change. So I'm very happy to hear Jane, uh, Jade's presentation there. And ultimately also bringing democracy and equity more to the surface in our societies. So these are some of the things that we worked on over these literally about 15 years with these universities across Africa and Asia. We also did a big project with the Southern African Regional Universities Association to review how universities were responding to climate change education or climate change education and research. And we found that surfaced the need for much stronger work on inter and transdisciplinary work in our universities, which we're continuing with. And also out of that a sort of very deep need and interest in working with our teachers. So we're currently working with the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa across the 11 SADC countries to try to work pretty much with every single teacher education institution, if we can, to support ESD communities of practice in these um, higher education institutions that are training the next generation of young people on the African continent. And we are having some really exciting activities emerging there. And we tend to work around the notion of self-driven change and change in communities of practice, because to, to produce change, we always say it's got to start somewhere and people have to believe in, in the change. And then we find people expand the changes and over years, things just seem to grow and grow. So there's like a huge impact actually out of these sort of change project works and courses, courses with educators that we've been running for, as Stephen said, I think probably almost 25, 30 years in, in Africa. So I think that's a, just probably enough from me to start with. So, yeah. So just to center the educator, thank you, Jade, for <laughs> opening that up. <laughs> Thanks, Hela. Um, yes, well done in distilling such a, uh, such a, a, a large range of experience into, into a, a few minutes. I know that's, that's not easy. But I think what we've heard from the four speakers is that um, change is difficult, but possible. Uh, and it's certainly something which I've always had in the forefront of my mind, what's possible in any situation. And I think, you know, I worked at the University of Plymouth for 12 years trying to, trying to encourage systemic change in the institution. And myself and my colleagues knew that you have to take almost every opportunity. And you, yes, you do need the institutional strategy but you also need to work with people at the at the ground level and and have changes happening throughout the, the, the institution uh, to gradually invoke systemic change and cultural change and um, uh, and there's no as we know there's no single blueprint that you just pick up and do and it's much harder than that and also more exciting than that in, in some way so I'm going to um, move to the discussion and thank all our speakers again for being so concise um, and informative and we have some guiding questions for the discussion which uh, if you participants have downloaded the program you'll see um, and we don't have to be bound by them but I think that's a good starting point um, so the first one is what effective changes or innovations have been made and are currently being made at your institution that address one or, one or more of the SDGs. And uh, you, if, if you want to answer that or have a, have a crack at that, you might also, I think, talk about um, effectiveness. How do we know we're being effective? Uh, you may want to look at that too. So um, I think I'm going to uh, aim that one at Ingus first, if that's all right. Inga? Yes, uh, I can share with a wider community a good example of successful sustainability project in our uh, community. I can identify um, uh, the creation of um, innovative interdisciplinary research and innovation ecosystem. 
uh, within our university. Um, uh, six years ago, or even more, we have a, a very big challenge uh, of overcoming the disciplinary research uh, divided between the faculties uh, to more, uh, we were a more teaching oriented uh, institution and we had uh, uh, a challenge of fostering uh, uh, inter and transdisciplinary research. Uh, after intensive internal discussions, the decision was taken to develop an alternative uh, parallel uh, research operating system uh, and um, an interdisciplinary ecosystem network of uh, 16 social innovation research uh, laboratories, uh, researchers teams uh, was created, uh, inviting uh, the best research, uh, researchers from uh, our academic uh, units, uh, faculties to unite their competencies, uh, contributing to the urgent uh, national, regional, and global SDGs-related uh, challenges. So we opened uh, justice, security, human rights, values, gender, environment management, public governance, uh, life and psychological welfare, lifelong learning, and uh, other labs, uh, researchers' teams. And those teams were invited to work in a completely new environment, new building uh, with an appropriate to social sciences uh, research infrastructure. And uh, this ecosystem of content uh, teams was also supported uh, by the Administrative Research and Innovation Unit which created um, a strong research support in the system to foster, uh, to foster the quality of project applications, successful implementation, research publishing, uh, dissemination of the results on various levels. And this uh, parallel operating system, MIU Labs, is focused um, solely on designing uh, the appropriate transformation. And um, it, um, it has to complement the existing uh, our research governance system at the university. Uh, because the traditional hierarchy of the university um, academic units ensured um, uh, this routine continuity and quality um, studies and disciplinary research and with newly established parallel operating system works as network-like structure and complements the traditional system and implements necessary transformation in research and innovation. So after six years of intensive activities, uh, this ecosystem has proved uh, its uh, effectiveness uh, as uh, those interfaculty teams successfully implemented the more than 100 national and international uh, interdisciplinary projects, also a lot of research contracts uh, created a wide uh, international academic and business uh, partners network, also a vibrant social innovations the doctoral school for PhDs and postdoc researchers uh, and increased uh, 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 in a very uh, effective way um, the visibility of university internationally. Okay, and uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to interrupt if that's all right because it's just a very short of time yes. uh, but, but that, was, that was very interesting how you uh, how you introduce change uh, without upsetting upsetting the the system entirely you know I think part of the challenge for us all is so much talk about transformation and transforming uh, universities and teaching um, but it's something which cannot be done over, overnight as, as I know to my cost actually in my, in my own university so that that's a very interesting case study just while I'm speaking uh, if you have a question um, there's a um, I'm talking to all participants now. There is a Q&A facility on the on the platform which you can use, and anybody is um, 
welcome to look at that and also offer uh, possible uh, answers uh, to, to people's questions. So, uh, so that's that. So, um, time is ticking by a little bit. Um, are, can I ask the panel to put their hand up if they want to um, address any of these questions as we, as we check them through? So, does anybody else want to comment on that first question, which I can see is now up on the share, uh, on the chat uh, column? If you if you want to see those, everybody. So, uh, Diana and Hela and Jade, are you interested in the first question? Um, what changes have been made? Jade has her hand up, uh, Stephen. Okay, I've got a tiny picture here, I can hardly see, but okay. yeah. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Jade. Perfect. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, that for me, I, I can kind of really understand that kind of rate of change that is happening at the moment. So I think as I touched on earlier, like we know through our student research that the interest has been there for a really long time. And I don't really know what it is recently that has kind of sparked that kind of sudden sudden movement of change. Um, I would love to be able to attribute that to the kind of the student voice and their ability to, to really kind of make a difference and make, I think kind of come together and make their voices heard as, as a collective. Um, and I think we can see, see that change really impacting universities and campuses across the board. So we can see universities declaring climate emergencies, they are making ambitious carbon reduction targets, and, and there just seems to be a whole weight of movement that is happening at the moment that I haven't seen for a really long time. And for me, this is really, I think it's been reflected in, in how the conversations on campus are changing in the 10 years ago when we were talking about sustainability it was very much kind of focusing on biodiversity or maybe recycling which I still think are incredibly valuable topics to look at but more and more we are seeing conversations being widened and broadened out and thinking about um, embedding it in curriculums as Inga was talking about um, about having kind of broader discussions on um, social justice and, and really kind of expanding that out and I think that that has been kind of reflected also within the SDGs as well and that we are now talking about sustainability in a broader manner that the SDGs are presenting than we ever have done before. Great yeah I think there's a there is a wave of change happening I think we can all see it um, and I would agree that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's unprecedented really uh, certainly in my work over 30, 40 years, to suddenly see this wave suddenly coming together. And I think, you know, I would, I would characterise it as learning. You know, I think there's learning going on both in society and amongst politicians and business leaders and the rest of it, but also in universities. I've always maintained that, you know, to get the sort of whole institutional response that we're advocating today, uh, you need to be a learning organisation. And, um, and people tend to think in academia just about learning in terms of student experience, but we need the, we need the uh, staff learning experience to, to, to make that happen. And I think that's all part of the transformative process. So I'm going to jump a little bit um, because I think institutional strategy is important, that second question, uh, but it, we know it doesn't, it doesn't uh, mean anything by itself. You know, if, if there's not a readiness in the universities, the strategy uh, will not uh, be effective. So um, I, uh, I just want to jump again with an eye on the clock to the third question. And I think it's um, pertinent to the discussion we've had so far. What opportunities and barriers have, you, barriers have you encountered and how have you taken opportunities and transcended barriers? So has any of our panelists like to, to address that one? Ayla, yes, thank you. Yes, I think that um, if I had to think back of the barriers, the most important barriers that we've tried to transgress in the institution without, um, you know, uh, undervaluing the importance of having our institution is the two, I think, one is the history of research methodology in the sense that the history of research methodology is very uh, stuck actually in a history of description and 
type of analysis, analytical kind of research. So we've really tried to complement that with what we call generative research, which is a more kind of forward-looking research, engaged research, transdisciplinary research, action research. You know, there's so many expansive learning research, there's so many names for that kind of research now, which initially they weren't, and it was very poorly developed practice. And I think we've seen, you know, improvement in methodologies for this kind of work over the last maybe 15, 20 years, and we've actively worked at that. So for me, that was a major barrier. It still is. It shows itself up particularly in university ethics protocols, because they are still based on a very sort of conservative concept of research and haven't actually brought themselves to think about research as a practice for the common good uh, in an engaged type of approach. So that's the one barrier. The second barrier, which we've also tried to transgress is the credentialing barrier. And it's a credentialing barrier that gets structured according to levels. And it's a kind of notion of, you know, pro progress according to the individual cognitive gain, uh, which is structured according to level. Now, this is obviously the main raison d'etre, if you like it, of, of, of the hierarchical structuring of education, which is a very deep and long kind of colonial history uh, and so on. But so we've really tried to actively disrupt that to produce what we call participatory certificate courses, which run, we call them long, long short courses, which run under the banner of our short course initiative but they are multi-leveled and they also multi-actor and they, you can bring a farmer with a sort of basic entry level post-schooling qualification together with somebody with a master's and a PhD degree and you can bring multidisciplinary groups together in that kind of learning formation. These are extremely powerful for, for sustainable development work because they allow for multi-actor engagement and so what you have to do is transgress the, the credentialing system into something a bit more innovative. You know? So those are the two big ones for, for me that have allowed us to do creative and strong sustainability work out of our universities. Thanks, without without uh, you know, reducing the university or thinking that what is there is inadequate because what is there is very important but this is like adding value to the current concept of a university, I think. Yes. Well, I think it seems to be some sim similarity there between what you've just said and, um, and the experience at, uh, in Lithuania uh, that Inga was talking about. So interesting parallels. Okay, so um, do any of uh, the panelists want to still look at this idea of, of opportunities and barriers that encountered and, and maybe lessons learned from trying to make these changes. I would like to. Diane, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would like to add to what Hela just said, um, how we have some difficulties building teamwork and disseminating this um, work with the different institutions and different entities inside of the, of the country uh, in terms of this, um, not only the SDGs, but the 2030 uh, agenda objective. So um, it's true that Costa Rica occupies the 33rd uh, position among 162 countries, <coughs> excuse me, evaluated in the SDG index um, with this global score, um, which position us in the same level of most advanced economies in the world. But still we have a lot of work to do in terms of how we um, deal with um, institutions, entities, uh, grassroots organizations outside the university because we have a lot of uh, good um, practices inside in terms of effective changes going to um, uh, implementation of mechanisms, um, clean energy, affordable water, the three R's, but still when we have uh, this opportunity to deal with global and but local, especially uh, local um, organizations, local um, governments, we we don't find this um, uh, link between uh, what we are teaching and how we are advancing inside the university and how we can transfer and um, work together 
joined forces in terms of advancing this agenda for the country and for the Central American region. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I did have a, a, a sort of supplementary question for you, actually, um, Diana, which is um, how, which I referred to really a little bit earlier, which is how do you how do you know with this outreach work? Uh, you're being effective. You know what? What do you have? Some ways of, of measuring. I don't want to get into metrics, but if you know what I mean, how how do we know, how do we evaluate uh, uh, success in, in the programs? Um, actually, we have this program from the university that um, before graduating, they the students have to do with um, have to finish three hundred hours of uh, local community service, mm. and with this community service we can measure how we uh, transfer the sustainable um, SDG um, agenda to the communities uh, where in Costa Rica and that's, um, that's true for the rest of Latin America. We have Afro-Descendants, we have indigenous populations. We have um, different territories in which all these programs can, can go and transform the reality and build um, these kind of connections uh, that we are not having with the central or local government. So uh, when we go and see what's going on uh, inside of the community, we can realize that we can change a little bit what we are um, dealing with from the university and from the academia and transfer and actually start speaking the same language that the communities are are, are facing in terms of their reality, in terms of their resources, in terms of how they cope with uh, the necessities they have and how we can just put in a very simple language uh, what um, these SDGs and uh, um, the results they want to, to see in terms of the region, in terms of the, of the country uh, are possible for, for, um, for even Latin America as well. Mm. Thank you. So, so panel, what, what are the main, where are the main barriers? Are they, is it the very senior managers or is it um, the academics or even the students sometimes, or is it beyond the institution with the expectations of society and politicians? You know, where, where are the main barriers in your experience uh, and how have you managed to transcend them or get around them? Any other responses on that? Jade, did I see your hand, Jade? Um, yep, yeah, perfect. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I think for me, I think higher education institutions have a, a really tough job at the moment yeah. in that whereas I, I expect kind of primary and secondary education have a very clear kind of ask, which is that they need to kind of deliver that foundation level of sustainability knowledge to their students. I think universities have a much trickier kind of current time that they they're having to both provide that level of foundation learning but also develop on that so we know that students arrive at higher education with a whole kind of range and varying levels of understanding and skills and knowledge on on the topic so definitely i think higher education has has a really tough job in trying to kind of meet all of those entry points and i think this is kind of really echoing a bit of what kind of Hayla was saying as well about kind of trying to get different levels within that learning. So I know for us, in, we're trying to kind of think about that in terms of trying to get those different entry levels for different students with different levels of knowledge and see it as a bit of a journey and a pathway so we can take those different levels of knowledge and then kind of let students go on that journey through their, inst through their time at their institution to then get to get to the end point and, and for us that is having that level of knowledge and understanding but really what we want is for students to be coming out of their higher education system not just understanding the problem but having the skills to be able to implement that as a solution going into their future careers and that's where I think higher education has a massive opportunity that we have students coming into that system and going out that go into jobs and disciplines and our future leaders and decision makers 
in all different areas of society. So if we can get that right, then we have a huge opportunity to get sustainability embedded across all of those areas. But I think the kind of the broadness of that problem is definitely one of the barriers of how do you get that learning and that opportunity and those skills within all of the different disciplines within a higher education. And yeah, I think that's that's a big challenge, but I think it's also a really exciting opportunity as well. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's, it's a question here. I mean, we know that uh, institutional change takes time uh, and probably should take time for it to be properly embedded. Um, but also it's a question of urgency, as we know, you know plan on a planetary level. So I think, there's a, you know, we have a, all of us in this field have a difficult task to facilitate effective change um, in, in this circumstance, even, even though, it, you know, the, the broader context is shifting quickly too, which is, in a sense is a good thing. Um, can I ask, oh, why, before I do this, can I in, invite everybody who's a participant to fire your questions in the Q&A and we'll come to those shortly if we can. If you, there's anything you want, to pick up or ask the panel, please put your question in the Q&A box. Um, thank you. So can I ask the panel, um, because the webinar is largely about shifts and changes associated with the sustainable development goals, which have been a catalyst for change. But I guess my question is, um, how far, how far have the SDGs been and how far are they still uh, a key um, facilitator of the kind of changes we're talking about today? Oh, aren't they? Anybody want to crack at that one? I think Inga had her hand up. <laughs> I'll call her back to the seat. Okay. I had to reflect a little bit on the barriers and opportunities, you know, especially as we are starting working on the whole institution approach. So we have uh, three main barriers which we have identified. The, first of all, um, we are a very diverse community and the main challenge uh, which can be highlighted is changing of community mindset and behavior. It's not easy to unite different generations of students, uh, teachers, adult uh, learners, professionals, and alumni. So lots of awareness raising, trainings, uh, capacity building activities are already implemented and uh, waiting ahead. Another barrier is um, a strong leadership commitment which we are also working in within the institution. I am talking not only about top management uh, commitment, but also the commitment of academic administrative units, leaders uh, um, and their teams, uh, how to uh, in reality implement, especially in the area of teaching, because from our institutional perspective, we started more on research activities and now we are making a priority of integrating SDGs into the teaching activities. Also, the third issue is funding, which is also a challenge in a short term period, especially when we raised our aim to and uh, transform the infrastructure and landscape um, in, uh, on campus. And it requires additional uh, investment. Uh, and of course, university couldn't manage to make it in uh, a short term, but the upcoming uh, financing period, uh, uh, a lot of national and regional competitive funding schemes, such as the Horizon Europe, Erasmus Plus, uh, also uh, structural funds and post-pandemic recovery programs, I think in a long distance will allow us uh, to overcome this important uh, barrier. So some reflections. Thank you. Is there a danger that the SDGs are still 
treated in a, a silo manner rather than you know um, affect, affecting um, the kind of cultural shift that we're talking about here. I think I think some universities, from what I've heard, you know the particular SDGs are treated in particular parts of the university and the rest of the university is unaffected. So are there uh, stories or examples where that's been the case or where we've managed to transcend that kind of silo treatment of the SDGs? Any responses on that? Okay, yes, Hayla, sorry. Yeah, I think the SDGs um, for me are something quite interesting for universities in the sense that they are almost iconic uh, policy instruments. The, so, you know, you can ask the question, what is the re relationship for a university with an iconic policy instrument? So there are different things that happen. One is that they inspire and they inspire people to do, you know, quite interesting research. So for example, the SDGs are being used in quite an interesting transdisciplinary research program uh, around water, which is connecting the university to the town, to our local water crisis, which is a massive local crisis. And so the SDGs, have become an instrument of bridge building between the university and the municipality and the community in town in that particular case. There's another role for universities with when you have uh, something like an iconic policy instrument and that is also to be a little bit skeptical and careful with how you see and work with these. So when you start look into them you start to see there's a number of weaknesses inside the SDGs they're contradictory to some extent. There's absences that are very important. For example, you know, the absence of emphasis on, 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 on militarism and the mm, transnational capital flows, they don't appear in the SDGs. Now, a university's job is also to raise those kinds of issues, make your students aware of them. So I think there's an ambivalent relationship with SDGs for universities, the inspiring, the structuring of policy inside universities, but then also this, you know, role of, 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 of not being naive and, and opening up the spaces that need to be, be examined further. So that's how I work with the SDG, certainly. In, and I've seen, you know, various forms of that type of diversity of engagement with SDGs in university, which I think is very important that we are allowed to do that and hold that creative space open for working with SDGs. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, yes, I, I, you know, I, I certainly heard that discussion that um, uh, a critical view of SDGs is required within universities, so they are a beginning of the debate rather than setting a closed agenda. Uh, and there's been various critiques of SDGs, uh, and, and surely that's part of the higher education's role to critique in a constructive way and see how that is what can be taken forward. Uh, which reminds me, because I'm trying to do two things at once here, um, the Q&A, uh, um, one participant has pointed out that uh, some experts dismissed the SDGs as nation state level greenwash, um, and I certainly had that, that argument before, and he finishes, how do we shift from the incrementalism, which the SDGs appear to propagate towards a whole scale transformational change? And I think that I, I, you would like to answer that. <laughs> I, no, I that if... just means that we're answering it live, sorry. For the okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. Ahead. I saw that line there, I thought maybe one of you wanted to talk about that. Um, so, yeah, does anybody want to comment on, on this particular matter? How we, how we view the SDGs and treat them and critically as a, a prompt for, for, for debate rather than taking them in whole scale, wholesale. And has that debate taken place within your institution? Clearly it has at, at Halis. Oh, okay. 
Can I can I maybe come in very quickly, yeah. Stephen? Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not one of the panelists, but uh, I am very uh, very impressed by the presentations made so far and the contributions to the debate. But I think your question is uh, absolutely essential. What do universities do with the SDGs? There are many who question still what they can do with it if they can engage with Agenda 2030. If the SDGs are the answer. We had a session recently where one of the rectors said, but this is our, our backdrop to everything that we do uh, that was in Ireland and we've embedded it heavily in our, uh, our strategic plan. And another rector said, but it's useless. We can't do anything with it. So we have everything in between from yeah. total engagement with to total uh, disengagement with. Um, and at the same time, yes, there is a bit of that greenwashing. It's uh, it's. Uh, um, it's, um, it seduces with all these little uh, icons and the colorful schemes, etc. But what people sometimes also forget is to read Agenda 2030, the document itself, and the philosophy that it carries, and, and the way in which it looks at what we as a collective, um, the society as a whole, can do to engage with sustainable development. And so the S SDGs are, are there now. Uh, we had the MDGs before, we have the SDGs now, we have others to challenge challenges, the grand challenges, we will probably not be able to address by 2030, but we know that we have to pay a lot of attention to them. And universities are doing that in many, many different ways beyond the SDGs, I would like to say, because that's a debate we very often have at IAU conferences, in debates, in specific sessions on, on uh, sustainable development, and it's healthy. It's good to question it. It's good to see uh, what we can do with this. Uh, at the same time, I, I believe that the ESD agenda, the Education for Sustainable Development, which has as, um, as a counterbalancing act the uh, R for SD, the Research for Sustainable Development, those two are absolutely key to advance in the future. And uh, I see um, um, from what happens in Latin America or in Costa Rica or uh, with the student unions in uh, Lithuania for the, for the panel the, that we have today, there's a lot of energy that is being put in this and many answers that are being developed. And maybe one of the points that is so key and that Jade maybe uh, worded first and then the others as well, but is how to educate the kind of citizens that we wish for a better world. How can they take up the positions wherever they are in society next to be equipped in the most um, uh, appropriate way to, to be the, themselves the developers of the solutions we need for our planet in all the different sizes and shapes and forms. So I just wanted to, to throw this in because I think everybody is saying it uh, in, in different ways and it's picked up in the discussion as well. Um, but um, it's not for universities to address the SDGs. It's um, the universities were never the target group for, for Agenda 2030. But the, the philosophy behind is something that, that you all pick up. Uh, Inga, Hela, Jade, Diana, uh, Stephen. So maybe uh, as a feed to the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Hedish. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm reminded there of um, something that uh, Jade said, um, really about the huge potential here, uh, not least because young people have energy and ideas and commitment and enthusiasm to, to make a change. And I, I think the, you know, there's now the, the buzzwords are, are, are restoration and regeneration, re regenerative education, and regenerating communities and economies and, and so on, which is about not doing things in a, a less bad way, but in a positively good way. And I find that a really quite an exciting idea. And I think, uh, you know, I think universities have a lot to play for if they can actually get behind this agenda and help uh, empower young people and communities to be part of the solution, if, if you like. Um, yeah, so where do we go here? So it's now quarter to, quarter to the hour. Um, I wonder if we should just um, uh, look at, and well, let me just invite any other comments on, on the questions we have before us before we move on to the uh, ideas on key recommendations to be taken forward. So does any of our panelists want to make a, another comment or being inspired to, by, by another thought while we've been talking? 
Okay. Okay, so can I invite you to think about the uh, fourth question? Uh, and also, if there are questions on the Q&A, which you think you can answer, if you could type away on, on that, panelists, um, that would be helpful. There are rather less of those than I, I thought there would be. So there's still time if you're out there and still part of the webinar and want to put in a question, there's still time to, to do so. Thank you. Um, so there, the fourth question, based on your experience and institutional learning, what key recommendations or statements would you like to be shared at the sessions on universities and ESD at the World Conference on ESD, which is coming up in a, in a week or two? Um, so this is an opportunity, we hope, to, to influence thinking and debate. And um, I think we originally thought Elish, that there might be three key ideas coming forward, and I, I guess it could be more, if we, if we thought of more. Um, so I'm opening that to the panel. Are there other key ideas which you, or recommendations you'd like us to, to take forward to the World Conference? Jake, yeah. Um, for me, I think it's just reiterating kind of the things and themes that I've said before in that, it's the, the real key thing for myself is seeing the value of students as our future leaders and decision makers and workers and employees um, and just making sure that they can get the skills that they're asking for and that their concerns about the climate are being reflected by their institutions and seeing the opportunity that students have to deliver that kind of difference in in the future across all walks of society and life as well yeah i'm rather reflectful i said it a few minutes ago <laughs> all the better for it uh so yeah thanks for that absolutely yeah okay panelists do you have I key statements you'd like to take forward inga thank you yes so um, I want to, to raise one idea which can be also in, uh, developed in the discussion uh, of uh, the conference, World Conference on ASD. Uh, over the past decade, uh, the higher education sector saw the confrontation of uh, two different education paradigms and their efforts to coexist together in parallel. It's social cultural paradigm and market oriented neoliberal paradigm. Yeah. And this uh, fundamental social cultural paradigm is uh, long supported by uh, United Nations uh, and of course supports, strongly supports sustainable development, Agenda 2030 and SDGs. But we have this parallel market oriented neoliberal paradigm which uh, um, forces uh, higher education uh, to use market instruments such as ranking, standard testing, discipline-based uh, thinking, GDP-related indicators, and it had the enormous effect to the higher education systems uh, globally. But however, in the light of this post-pandemic economic and social recession, uh, the UN agenda and the ESD initiative will hopefully inspire the renaissance of the fundamental social cultural paradigm. And the creation of our collective well-being safe and inclusive education system. And I believe, my community also believe that its success is in our hands, but it will require more effective collaboration, capacity building, communication both within and uh, our higher education systems and between our countries and regions. Thank you. Thank you, Inga. I think that's a really valuable point. Uh, and uh, theme really, which we haven't touched on, and certainly something I, I've been thinking and writing about for years about the influence of paradigms on educational policy and purpose uh, and provision. And I think that's a really pertinent point that you made, and how, you know, that touches on what we talked about in terms of cultural change. Um, how do we 
present in the in the way the social eco, ecological paradigm as having extraordinary potential which is relevant to our times and i think you know in strict educational terms would be uh, enhancing educational um quality um so there's all kinds of arguments and why that needs to come through but it's 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 not it's not easy necessarily as we know and we'd, it's a that's a big topic which you don't have time to explore but i think something about that could go forward because i think it's a very very important theme so thank you for your contribution on that um uh okay so um time's getting a little bit short i need to leave time for uh hillage or isabel to to, to wrap up um, and say something more about how our IU is taking this forward. But um, I think we've got a few minutes left. So panel, are there other key ideas you'd like to see taken forward as part of this webinar? I would like to share. Yeah, done it, yeah. yeah. Uh, from this environmental citizenship that I addressed at the beginning, being with this environmental ethics, uh, it has to deal with obligations of human actions, humans as moral agents, um, these are joint responsibility, ecological and global justice, and all these matters. Um, some of the um, recommendations have to do with transitioning from this anthropocentric vision to a vision of solidarity between the natural and the human worlds, um, moving from divided, asymmetric, and unjust societies, and moving also to this consciousness of uh, having this transition to intergenerational consciousness responsibility for the future generations um, and ecological citizens for all because we are living the same we have the same home the planet so we have to be accountable for what we are uh, leading or leading to the to the next generations mm. well, that's, that's that's a very valuable perspective too. Thank you very, thank you very much. An inhaler. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thanks very much, Stephen, and thank you, colleagues. It's been such a lovely discussion. I think I want to leave with this recommendation for universities because um, universities are very special places, actually, because they have a certain kind of freedom that many other institutions don't have. They also have their stuck in the mud cultural histories that, but they can break free of those. So I really want to encourage universities to be bold and more, much bolder than they currently are in addressing these future challenges. And I think at the heart of that must be commitment to a real kind of like edgy type of transgressive learning and research and a concept of regenerative justice that reaches beyond the small scope of the nation state, but that can actually touch across the planet, as Diana was saying. So it's a big ask, but I feel that universities do have the power to, you know, really make those moves if they can get out of the stuck stuckness that yeah. yeah that's a that's a great that's a great thought too Hayla thank you it reminds me of a of a line which um Sarah Parkin put in a book I produced in 2013 and she said universities can make the change if they want to if they choose to <laughs> um and I, I'm just thinking time's ticking away but um you know, all the international authoritative high level reports now are talking about drastic changes in the way we do things, humanity does things in the next five or 10 years affecting the future. And universities have to, in my view, step up to the plate, step up to the challenge, because there's a huge positive uh, advantage to be won, I think. Uh, and I think that's uh, some of the uh, aspects of that um, have been come, be coming forth in the discussion uh, to date. Um, I feel I need to to leave uh, a few minutes for Hayley or Isabel, is that right, to 
present some closing and may, remarks. Maybe Isabel, maybe Isabel, you can also come on screen because Isabel is uh, is the person of whom you know the name, but not always see the face. She's doing a tremendous work on sustainable development, leading uh, also the work of the higher higher education for sustainable development cluster work with the IAU, uh, communicating with people from around the world. One of the the key points that we uh, make as a as an, a global association is to work on SDG 17 as well, the partnerships. With whom do you work and how do you work with people from around the world? And um, please, please, let's forget about rankings and, and best universities or whatever, but let's work together with any higher education institution around the world. They're all valuable in their own settings. They all provide for something special. They all uh, tailor to, uh, to the demands of students um, to, to become these meaningful uh, change leaders in their society. So all universities are equally important to uh, bring on board, discuss, uh, partner with, um, and, and let's certainly push for a way with the, uh, do away with, the, um, with these divides that are only, again, uh, market driven. I, I very much liked your point, uh, Inga, that many of us made uh, in different, different occasions, but it's very good to repeat it here because that's indeed a paradigm shift that has taken place over the last 30 years or so, which has driven universities also uh, back into the mud attitude, maybe, Hela, yeah. yes. <laughs> and, and back to not being the active um, places of change and, and, and uh, disruptive institutions. Uh, to, I think it's today that we have um, the, the um, Journalist Freedom Day. Is it today that we have the freedom of speech, the importance of universities to, to shout out loud what they, what they have to contribute, what they can contribute. And too many universities around the world are one after the next being muted. And they have no right to speak up. They have no place in their countries to, um, to play the active role they should play. And we are at risk in this COVID period of seeing many more universities silenced in the future because our leaders will make wrong decisions and they will um, uh, not put uh, the energy needed, both in terms of finances and trust in their systems uh, and in their institutions for them to advance the kind of world we want to live in all together. So students are silenced, academics are silenced, leaders as well. And okay. I think we, that's a very important point we have to make also, that education matters, sustainable development matters, that universities matter. So I don't know, Stephen, if you want to pick up on that, but I think the different points that are made here are absolutely essential to bring to the World Conference ESD, and I've noted them down. And I would like to share with the, um, the participants in this session that we will draft these up, that we will have a note, uh, a two-page note that we will uh, pick up from the conversations, that we will share back with the participants as well, if you allow, for you to comment on. We have two weeks, but we can make some of these points very powerful and strong and convey them to the global higher education community through the panel on higher education for sustainable development at the UNESCO World Conference on ESD. And that will be a first step. The second step will be the upcoming uh, World Higher Education Conference that UNESCO is also planning. The date has now shifted into 2022. We need to wait and see when exactly it will take place, but we can take the points from this webinar, from the conference to the next steps, and certainly make the, the important uh, points that you made during the webinar uh, heard uh, at the, the global level as well. But Stephen, uh, I will give the floor back to you as, uh, as chair of this session uh, and maybe give the floor back each one, one half minute if you want to add to this. But I think it's very important that we make these points uh, loud, sound and clear uh, that higher education matters. It has a lot to say. It has been muted and it is being muted in too many places. Uh, and maybe the energy has been taken out because we have to do all these ranking instead of the important work we have to do. Is that uh, something that I wanted to share as well? <laughs> I think that all fits. I think that all fits, Hillage, with what with the tenor, with the tenor of what's been said. 
uh, or, already. And I think there's a coherence, I think, in between uh, the contributions today, uh, which is quite powerful, I think. And uh, we have a, an important message to to take forward to the to the conference and beyond, I think. Uh, and it's very, very relevant, you know, and it's about uh, a necessary uh, shift of culture. And I think it's de demonstrated already uh, that it can be done and how effective it is and there's huge potential to be one. Um, and the time is now. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't want to uh, bang on any more myself, but let me um, ask for just a quick comment from each of the panelists, uh, if they wish. If you don't want to, that's fine. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So um, uh, Diana, you're first on my screen. Would you like to, to say something? I subscribe everything that you just said and all the panelists. I'm so um, I feel humble and honored to be speaking all of you. And I hope that the conference is going to listen to all these recommendations and adopt them and get to spread the word uh, in the entire planet. We need to, to make a change and we're thinking about the future and uh, the actual uh, generation. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. Enga, you're, you're muted. Would you like to say something? Yeah. Yes, I want only one statement. Uh, who, if not we, professional education uh, communities, and when, if not now, uh, should take an urgent action to shape the sustainability mindset, attitudes, behaviors, to unite our communities' intellectual uh, resources, and to lead them towards the solutions of global societal challenges, towards a more just, peaceful, and sustainable world. Thank you. Well, well said. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hela, you're, you're muted at the moment. Yes. Yep. Thanks, Stephen. I also just maybe just end where you started, and you started by saying that you know you've noticed there's an enthusiasm for change, and I feel that enthusiasm for change very strongly amongst the young people on our yeah. continent. African continents, young people are, 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 are driving for change. So I feel we have to create the space for that to grow. So let's embrace that enthusiasm for change, create the spaces for that creativity to emerge in our societies, and we will look at a better future. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, a nice metaphor. I think the, the market uh, paradigm is, is squeezed the space. It's become narrow, and I think we need to liberate it to for the education's potential to be realized now. Thank you, uh, Hayla. So, uh, Jade, please, if you have a last yes. comment. Just a thank you for allowing me to be here and kind of put across that student voice and perspective. Yeah. And really kind of emphasizing, as I always will, that students should really be seen as that kind of part of the solution and not kind of go out of university as part of the problem. Yeah. So thank you very much. I think I think what's exciting is that they are now insisting that it should be, <laughs> which, which is quite exciting, really. Uh, and rightly so. Thank you, Jade. Um, so I'm going to hand the baton, so to speak, back to Hillage to round us off. And thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you from thank me. You. Thank you from me to everybody for your um, your articulate uh, and uh, you know heartfelt contributions to I think it's been a very rich debate which can only go forward we hope thank you yeah excellent I would like to thank you all for your wonderful contributions there is much more to come and I always feel halfway and even towards the end of any webinar that is too short that's the limitation of our digital world today that we don't have a time for a coffee break afterwards or a glass of wine where we could join and then exchange further and and come back to it the next morning and and deepen our conversation but we will thanks to that uh, to that document that we're now drafting as well look at the chat um, i saw john north um, calling for um, uh, quite a few things that are very important to pick up on this divide 
divide between the promise and the practice. Also, another person whom I don't see the name, but who's calling for a whole person learning approach, which actually was always at the heart of what the university stood for. We have to go back to that. Um, and also for the inclusion of other voices, of course, here already we have Costa Rica, South Africa, Europe, uh, the students at large, uh, and uh, um, a, a moderator that represents the world. So we, ha we have so limited space and obviously we will bring in more Asian speakers as well as we do so in our upcoming webinars. So uh, Isabel, thank you. You've put in the chat the, um, the space where you can find um, the, the recording in, in, a, in a few days. The recording of this webinar will be made available. The recordings of previous webinars are there as well. And there are two uh, webinars coming Coming up, one on strategies and internationalization. We also have a, a very good webinar coming up on open science in a closed world, which will be um, uh, backed with a special issue of the magazine IU Horizons with uh, more than 30 papers on what it means, open science, open access in a closed world and where can we go. And then the next session, uh, the next slide, please, Isabel, will be um, on sustainable development on a June, where we will speak uh, again on higher education leadership practices and how uh, to also develop further leadership for sustainable development. And we may, we have a space for one extra speaker and we, if we can again uh, secure a speaker from an Asian country, we will do so. That's the promise to the speaker in, to, to the question in the Q&A. So we pick it from here. I would like to really thank you, Stephen, for an excellent moderation, uh, Hela, Inga, Diana, and Jade for your wonderful contributions, um, Isabel for the facilitation and preparation of this webinar. This is only one in a series because we have to speak about this more and much more, and we have to make this case for the role of higher education for sustainable development each and every time. We believe in our own groups that uh, it exists that there is sufficient attention, but I also heard all of you say, well, there is also this difficulty of having uh, the role of higher education for sustainable development recognized. And so let's make sure that this um, um, better connection, let's say, with all the stakeholders in society is ensured even further uh, in the future. There are many more questions I would have had, but we've overspent the time. <laughs> we see people leave. And also thank you for your time as uh, speakers to this event. Um, very much appreciated. And we uh, take it from here. We'll be in touch for next steps. Thank you. <laughs> Merci. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Au revoir. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias.